Yeah. Thanks, Dick. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Danny Goldstein. Uh, I'm a grad student here at Berkeley. Peter Nugent, who spoke in the last session, is my advisor. Um, and today I want to tell you about how we actually find the changes in the night sky that Peter talked about. Uh, what are the algorithms that we actually use to detect sources that are moving, changing in brightness, or actually just appearing uh, where there wasn't any uh, source of light before? And just as, a, as an example of this, you know, here, here are some before, after, and, and difference photos of, of supernovae in just one very small region of sky uh, over a couple of years. And so what I'd like to do is convince you that now this has become a real-time decision-making problem. I want to give you a sense of some of the strategies and, and techniques we've developed to deal with it, and then just end with a little bit of a picture of the science outlook now that we've been able to, to kind of get this under control. Um, but before I jump into uh, supernova detection as a real-time decision-making problem, I want to talk a little bit about uh, when supernova detection and, and finding new objects on the sky was not a real-time decision-making problem. Um, so, so this is actually an instrument from the 1930s. It's called a blink comparator. And this is how, um, this, is how this problem was solved uh, for the vast majority of the 20th century. Basically, you'd go out uh, one night with your telescope, and you'd point it at some region of the sky and put a photographic plate at the focus of the telescope. And you would uh, you know, put it here on this side of the machine. Then you'd go out a couple days later and do the same thing and put your, put your photographic plate uh, on this side of the machine. And then light would come on and illuminate, uh, uh, illuminate the plates. And you could flip between them with this wheel and look through the viewfinder and blink back and forth between the images to look for differences between them. And so people would go out and, and do this. Um, and you know, here's a, a really famous example of this. This is Clyde Tombaugh. He's an American astronomer uh, who, you know, this is him using one of these in 1935. Um, and, by doing this, you know, led to a very important astronomical discovery, one of the most important uh, of, of the 20th century. Basically, by flipping back and forth between these two images, one taken on January 23rd and then one taken six days later, of course, it's, all, it's, it's blindingly obvious that this object is not here in the second image, right? It's actually moved over here. And so this was, this was how, how Pluto was discovered. Um, so you know, this, this, this problem of, of finding changes in the night sky is, is not only uh, a long-standing problem in astronomy, but it's also very important. Um, and it's led to, it's led to major scientific uh, you know, advances, right? So this is, this is now our image of Pluto, whereas before it was just this little dot uh, flipping between two photographic plates. Now we've actually sent a spacecraft and mapped out the surface of this, uh, of this uh, minor planet. It's no longer a planet in, in great detail, right? And we've got these beautiful images. And, um, and so, so, this, so this problem is extremely important in astronomy. And um, this is just to give you an idea of, of you know, the kinds of returns we can get by doing this. OK, so I'm sure Peter mentioned this a little bit. But this is just a very quickly Supernova Discovery 101. Uh, it turns out that looking for supernova and looking for objects that move on the sky like Pluto is actually a very similar problem. Um, we're doing something very similar to what Tombaugh was doing. Basically, you take an image of the sky at, at some time. Um, and now we have these fancy CCD detectors, which have digital readouts. So we can subtract away an image of the same part of the sky from an earlier time and then just have this digital kind of matrix uh, of this residual image of subtraction which every point of light on this uh, image shows something that's present in the new image that wasn't there um, just in the, in the image prior. Um, and so uh, you can have algorithms go through and, and you know, check each one of these uh, detections of, of variability on this residual image. OK, and it turns out that this, uh, there's a blob of light here in this, uh, in this new image that wasn't here in the old one. And actually, that's a supernova. So, this is kind of schematically how we, we search for these changes in brightness on the night sky today. But there's a huge, huge problem with this, um, a huge bottleneck, which is that more than 99% of the little dots that you see on this image are total garbage. They're absolutely bogus detections of variability. They're not astrophysical sources. Um, 
And in order to really discover truly variable objects like this supernova, we need to go through all of these uh, detections of variability and find the one little one thing that's actually scientifically interesting. So, um, so I'm sure you can imagine we're living in this time of, you know, of machine learning, and this is 75 years ago. And so if you fast forward uh, you know, 75 years later from when this was going on to maybe, say, 2005, I'm sure you would expect there to be a much more advanced way of doing this, right? But actually, the technique Really, in 75 years to about 2005, uh, it hadn't really changed all that much. Um, so the technique was to, and here's this is me doing a dramatic reenactment of this, to get a graduate student or more likely an army of graduate students to go through. And instead of photographic plates, we now have these web pages. And you sit there and you click through each individual object that you extract from each of these subtractions. And it takes hours and hours, and it's extremely, extremely tedious. And uh, many unfortunate graduate students have lost hours of their lives to this uh, process over the years. Um, sure but they're not worth that much per course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, 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 the part that really makes this different from, from um, looking for, for minor planets like Pluto is that uh, for, for supernovae, um, these things fade away. And we want to catch these things early. We want to learn as much about them as possible. Um, and so we have, uh, we have to send targets, supernova targets, to telescopes like this for follow-up observations. And as Peter said, this telescope time is very valuable. Okay, One night on Keck is worth about $50,000. Uh, one orbit of the Hubble Space Telescope around the Earth is worth about $100,000. Um, and so you know, to make sure that we really get the, the best return on our investment um, with this time, we need to make sure that the targets that we're sending to these telescopes are actually good and that we've gone through these whole list of spurious detections and made sure that we've really found all of the objects that are actually scientifically real and astrophysical and, and sent the best ones off to, to go be looked at in, in more detail. Um, and so uh, the Palmar Transient Factory, which, which Peter described, was really the survey that kind of ended this insanity for good. Okay, so so this was this was when things really changed, um, and you know, uh, and basically, as as Peter said, this is it's a it's a survey uh, based at Mount Palomar using this uh, distinguished uh, Palomar 48-inch telescope, this telescope with a rich history uh, of making all kinds of, of different scientific discoveries to robotically scan the sky and take images of of different parts of the sky. Uh, every single night with a, with a high cadence. And then uh, when interesting objects were detected, it would use these other telescopes, the 60 inch here and the 200 inch, to get spectroscopy of them, to, to follow them up in more detail. Um, this is the camera, uh, 92 megapixels. Uh, it, can resolve, it, can, uh, it can resolve something that's about the width of a dime at a mile away. Uh, it takes about 300 of these exposures every single night. This is a picture of the telescope here, fully robotic. Um, and uh, in total, it produces about 3,000 of, uh, of these CCD uh, uh, images every single night. So 3,000 of these chips, which you then go on to produce subtractions with and then have to have graduate students, or maybe not anymore, uh, scan through all of the things that you find on them um, in order to, to see if they're real or not. So, this was a survey really when the data rate was, this was the first survey where the data rate was so absolutely mind-bogglingly high that, that this uh, manual scanning technique really just ceased to be viable. So it produced about 1.5 million detections of variability every single night. Um, the vast majority of these weren't real. They could be artifacts uh, of the difference imaging process or artifacts on the image misalignment of the images, uh, saturation of the CCD from bright stars. About 50,000 of them were known asteroids, so not scientifically interesting. We already know about them. Uh, same thing with uh, about a, one or 2,000 of them being known variable stars. And out of this 1.5 million objects, about 100 of them were supernovae. And just three to four out of 1.5 million every night were actually new young supernovae that were really scientifically valuable and, and interesting. So this is a real needle in a haystack problem. 
Um, and the first, uh, the first kind of uh, automated attempt to, to deal with this uh, was to use uh, machine learning. Um, and uh, this, this was a classifier that was called the real bogus classifier one. Okay, this was, uh, this was pioneered by Josh. Um, and basically the idea was to uh, train an automated algorithm in real time to uh, do the work that graduate students have been doing for a long time and, uh, and take the streaming data from the telescope and pass it, through, uh, pass it through an algorithm and have it predict whether or not each object was actually a real astrophysical detection of variability or a spurious detection uh, of an artifact or something that was masquerading as, as real. And so um, this was start, work was started on this uh, classifier at the very beginning of the survey. It was so early on in the survey that they actually didn't have real ground truth labels to build a training set yet. So in order to create a training set, um, basically what was done was about 1,000 objects were uh, assembled and presented to a group of about 10 or 11 uh, human scanners. And then the scanners were asked to, uh, to you know, opine on whether or not they were, they were real sources of variability or whether they were bogus. And then by quantifying the, uh, the, the bias of each scanner, so some scanners were more optimistic. They tended to call things more likely to be real, whereas others were uh, more likely to call things bogus. So by quantifying the, the bias of the scanner relative to the group, um, these labels were created for these objects uh, and, and a training set uh, with this distribution of kind of scores from zero to one was, was uh, put together. And so then a random forest was, was trained on this. It was a very, very small sample, just about 1,000 objects uh, to, to generate these so-called real bogus scores. So something with a real bogus score of one is very likely to be real, something with a real bogus score of zero, very likely to be bogus. Um, and so, so this was tried out. And it was actually um, used in the broader context of this classification robot, uh, also uh, uh, developed by Josh, which would query the da this database of, of uh, transients every 20 minutes and compare uh, new transients with archival information to not only uh, to, to, bas to basically look at the entire light curve look at all of the detections of a, of a given object that had, been, uh, that had been made, and try to classify it at the next level, instead of just being real or bogus, to actually say something about what its nature was. Is this a supernova? Is this a, a tidal disruption event? Is this a, uh, you know, a variable star, et cetera? Um, and you can read all about this in what's now a classic paper. I think it's just got 100 citations. Uh, automating discovery and classification of transients and variable stars in the synoptic survey era. Um, in parallel, at the same time, um, there was a different approach that was being taken uh, in the survey to, to solve this problem. And this was just by crowdsourcing this problem of scanning out to the world. So instead of using 10 or 20 uh, graduate students, um, you could, the idea was to uh, publish the, the, this data set on the internet and have people all around the world um, go through and click through and, and do the scanning uh, uh, for the collaboration. So it was a part of this Galaxy Zoo project, which was a citizen science project to have people look at images of galaxies and try to um, classify them based on their morphology and the way that they looked. And so uh, in 2010, um, Peter spent a week with uh, the folks at Oxford setting up the database giving them training sets of good and bad candidates. And uh, the Oxford folks did the rest. About 1,200 people screened all of the candidates that were found between August 1st and August 12th in just three hours. So it was very, uh, there was a lot of interest in this. And um, certainly, they were, the volunteers were able to get through the data very quickly. The top 50 things that they found were all supernova or variable stars. And they actually were able to find three before the survey scientists themselves did. And in total, they scanned about 25,000 objects, which translated to a rate of roughly three per minute. And the, the kind of uh, steady state usage statistics were that they did about 250 of these nightly. And there were 15,000 people around the world who were participating in this uh, at peak. And so um, basically, the way that it worked was you would be presented with an image of, of, a, of, a, subtra of a subtraction object. And they would be asked a series of questions in a decision tree like this. 
Is there a candidate centered in the crosshairs of the right-hand image? Has the candidate itself subtracted correctly? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And by responding to each of these questions, a score would be built up. And, uh, and, and that score would, uh, would essentially determine the realness of the object. And so here you can see they did a pretty good job um, separating supernova from uh, the chaff. So this is the distribution of scores of all candidates, the vast majority of which are garbage. And you can see it's really peaked here at, at a value of minus 1. And then the supernova have a significantly dis different distribution from this. And so uh, you, can, you can see that, that people were able to pick these out relatively well. And there's a paper on this uh, that you can read, Galaxy Zoo Supernovae, uh, that detailed this project. So um, this is really an, uh, a great example of what became the new normal with this automated uh, 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 real-time decision-making um, alert system uh, with this real-time decision-making system in place for the survey. Um, basically, mere hours after uh, the first detection uh, of this supernova, um, it had been uh, passed through the Oracle automated robot that classified the light curves and filtered away from the chaff of all the other detections that were being generated by the survey. And just a couple of hours later, people had already uh, reacted to the discovery of this object. Um, a manual alert was issued at the Weizmann Institute, a collaborating institution of the survey. And uh, within, just, within just less than a, one day after the first uh, data was taken on the telescope, um, telescopes all around the world had been triggered to get more data of this object. And you can see what an amazing difference it made getting this object so early. This is a spectrum that was obtained uh, uh, one day, that was obtained uh, early on in the evolution of this object. And here's a spectrum that was obtained just one day later. So getting this early, early getting this spectrum just one day earlier, really you can see that you're able, there, there was a huge amount of change between the two. And uh, getting this early data really allows you to see that this thing is evolving quite quickly. You get all of these interesting lines and features. And they were able to just get this beautiful multi-band light curve data set. Um, and so this was really, this was really uh, I think, a transition point from when uh, looking for supernova was largely manual to really exploiting the full uh, uh, benefits of, of real-time decision making. OK, and of course, another major discovery that was made with this automated system was supernova 2011 FE. Peter talked about this. Uh, it's the closest type 1A supernova in the last 25 years, fifth brightest supernova of any type uh, in the last century. Um, and it was caught just 11 hours after explosion. It, w it, this, this is a totally unprecedented uh, uh, discovery of, of a supernova so early. Um, and by, by using this machine learning uh, classifier to, to catch this thing and filter out all of the other spurious detections so that uh, the scientists could dive straight to, to uh, uh, the detection of, of 11 FE, uh, they were able to get an unprecedented data set with telescopes from all over the world. Even amateur astronomers followed this thing up. And this is now the best observed type 1A supernova in, in history. And it's provided really a template for understanding the physics of type 1A supernova and comparing all of the other uh, uh, detections of this event that we get um, to what has now become uh, what people think of as the most normal type 1A supernova that's ever been found. Um, OK, so PTF ran for uh, a four or five years. Uh, and afterwards, there was a new incarnation of PTF called IPTF, the Intermediate Palomar Transient Factory. Um, and the main difference between IPTF and PTF was a uh, modernization of the software pipeline that was used for the survey. And so one of the main <laughs> updates that was made was to update the uh, machine learning uh, pipeline that was used for uh, automating artifact rejection. And so this is, uh, this is just an example of some of the artifacts on uh, IPTF images versus the real sources on IPTF images, you can get a sense of the, um, w the morphological differences that you see uh, between the artifacts and, and the supernova. And the main differences here uh, were that this real bogus classifier 2 
uh, was used in IPTF. Uh, both of these, uh, Real Bogus 1 and Real Bogus 2, were trained on PTF data. But whereas the training set for Real Bogus 1 was done with this uh, group of experts, this groupthink uh, expert labeling, by uh, the time of Real Bogus 2, there was already enough data that the survey had taken to build a training set of ground truth objects. And the training set was significantly larger. Now they were able to get about 78,000 sources um, to, to train with. And the complexity of the model also uh, increased. So whereas they were using 27 uh, time domain features, to, or shape and brightness features to uh, classify objects with real bogus one, now they were using 42 for uh, real bogus two. Um, an interesting thing that they did was improving their model by recursively eliminating features with this backward feature selection algorithm. So they started with the full model at the bottom and recursively removed features that improved the figure of merit, the training figure of merit uh, for the random forest. And so you can see here that by, uh, by removing features in this fashion, you can uh, drive this figure of merit down. A better classifier has a figure of merit that's, that's as low as possible. And then they stopped uh, when this rock curve was, went below a false positive rate of 1% with only a few features left in the model. So this, one of the really uh, great things about this process was that they were able to eliminate about half of the uh, dimensions of their parameter space with just 610 iterations. Uh, whereas if they tried every possible subset of parameter space, like the power set of the parameter space brute force, it would have taken 10 to the 11 steps. And they were able to improve the uh, performance of their classifier significantly by removing features. And so, um, so this, this was a big win. And actually, um, it was with this RB2 classifier that not only did the performance of the machine learning uh, beat humans in terms of time, it actually started to beat humans in terms of accuracy. So this is a receiver operating characteristic showing the misdetection rate uh, as a function of false positive rate for the machine learning classifier RB2 and the human uh, decisions from the citizen scientists. And what you can see is that, uh, is that for a data set of known supernova, the machine learning uh, at this point actually did significantly better than the humans that were out there. So now, we've, now there's a real-time decision-making framework for IPTF that outperforms crowdsource supernova discovery. And so while this was, was a great way to start the project uh, and a good form of public outreach, it actually became outmoded and no longer necessary for the survey. Um, so there, here are some other things about the classifier performed very well. Um, but one thing that I, that I want to mention is that um, you know, this technique really caught on. And so one of my first projects as a graduate student was to take this, uh, this classifier that was developed specifically for IPTF and actually try applying it to a different survey with a completely different telescope, a completely different instrument, different science goals. Um, and and this, is, uh, this was something that I did uh, my first year of graduate school. It, this is a dark energy survey, supernova survey. It produced about 170 gigabytes of data every single night, a million objects per season, so less than the data rate that we were seeing from PTF, but also the survey was covering a much smaller area of sky. Uh, again, the vast majority of these things were artifacts, and we had live target follow-up almost every week. So this was another case where this uh, machine learning was, was really necessary. And so again, we used a random forest trained on, uh, on features derived from, from the uh, difference images and from their context. And ones that passed a certain threshold could go on to be looked at by humans, whereas ones that, that failed the threshold uh, were uh, piped off to, uh, to be ignored. Um, and so just some key results from, from this project. Uh, Autoscan, the name of this code that I developed, uh, reduced the overall scanning load by over an order of magnitude with just a 1% loss in efficiency for finding these supernova. Um, it took the work that was being done by about 30 people 
and uh, reduced it down to, to just two people. And now this, uh, this pipeline is being used to guide the development of similar pipelines for future surveys. And I just want to point out that all of the data and code that I used to uh, write this uh, algorithm is available online. It's become kind of a standard uh, problem now, I think, in, in Astro machine learning. And I think there, there are also some computer science groups that are looking at this data set as well. So I encourage everyone to check this out, download the data. If you think you can do this better than we're doing it in DES, highly encourage that. Um, it achieved record setting performance on this task. So uh, when just 1% of the uh, spurious objects are being labeled real, we're losing just 6% of the uh, real detection. So that's, that's a really, uh, that, at the time that this came out, that was, that was a record setting uh, performance on this task. And now I just, I just want to say that um, you know, this has really become a cottage industry. This, this is now the standard way of doing supernova searches. Uh, there were a whole bunch of papers that, that came out after this, um, just setting up, try, trying to improve on this, setting up, trying convolutional neural networks for this, um, trying to combine human and machine classifications, applying this stuff to different surveys. And so now the era where people are looking at the subtractions to scan uh, for candidates is really over. So we've entered uh, a time where it is a standard thing for supernova searches to, to completely remove human beings from, from this loop where they uh, played an integral role for many, many years. OK, now I just want to talk about um, the implications of this, the new frontier. Um, we're living in a really exciting time right now in, in terms of supernova searches because we're about to get a slew of new surveys that are going to be doing supernova searches on a completely different level than anything that's ever been done before. Um, ZTF and LSST are the ones that I'm going to focus on. So ZTF is the successor of PTF, um, uses the same network of telescopes here at Palomar Observatory. The survey telescope will be the P48. Here is the PTF camera. I showed this uh, earlier in my talk. It covers 7.26 square degrees. There's a new camera that's been uh, developed and is going to be put at the prime focus of the P48. It's significantly bigger. And so this ZTF survey will survey the sky an order of magnitude faster than the PTF survey. Um, it's going to be able to cover 37 150 square degrees per hour, uh, which if mo you guys aren't astronomers, but take my word for it, this is unbelievably fast. It's really just crazy. Um, there's never been anything like this before. Uh, it's going to get 250 observations of each region of the sky per year. Yeah. Can you translate 3 pi survey? Yeah, so the whole sky is 4 pi, so it's like 75% of the sky. Um, each, each field uh, is going to have 250 observations per year. So we're going to get really well sampled variability catalogs of huge areas of the sky out to pretty, pretty uh, large depths. And the data rate is just going to be way, way higher for this than, than what we experienced with PTF. And then LSST is really going to change the game. This is, this is a totally unprecedented instrument. Um, it's being built right now out in the uh, mountains in Chile, on, in the Andes. Um, it's going to take about 1,000 images each night. Each one is going to be 3.2 gigabytes and the size of 40 full moons. Um, and it's going to produce 15 terabytes of data every night for 10 years. It's going to cover about 40% of the sky. And it's going to discover tens of billions of objects. And it's going to observe each one about 1,000 times. So this is actually. A way to think about LSST is it's going to be the first movie of the night sky over 10 years. We're going to be able to actually see this huge area of the sky and in tens of billions of objects evolve over time with these amazingly deep repeated exposures. And th this, is, this is really uh, going to take, it's going to completely transform astronomy, I think. By 40% of the sky per night? Um, it's going to be able to survey 40% of the sky every three days. So roughly a third of that per night. By the numbers, um, 
ZTF is going to detect one trillion uh, detections of variability. So the, the objects that, remember the points of light that I showed and the difference, image, difference images at the beginning, over the duration of the survey, one trillion of those will be produced. And then for LSST, we're going to have seven trillion. Huge amount of data. Uh, ZTF will detect uh, one billion distinct objects, and LSST will detect almost 40 times that. And each night, we're going to have so many detections of variability that, each, that we're going to have to move to a totally different model of distributing the fact that we've made these detections. Um, so now we're going to this alert-based system, this real-time kind of Avro alert-based system, where every time we find something that we think is varied, uh, we're, we're going to issue uh, an alert out that anyone in the world can go uh, pull down and try to do science with. Um, there's just going to be so much pixel data that actually the pixels are no longer going to be available to the scientists. So a million of these are going to come from ZTF every night and 10 million from LSST. And we're going to try to get these out in as near real time as possible. So uh, for LSST, we're aiming to, to get these uh, alerts out just 60 seconds after we make the original discovery. And for ZTF, the, the goal is to have it within 20 minutes. So this is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, as a blessing, you know, th these data sets are totally unprecedented. We're going to be able to make, you know, the question is like, what amazing discoveries are waiting to be made in, in these unprecedented data sets? We're going to be getting so much data every single night that, you know, th the possibilities are, are really exciting. But of course, now we have a lot more pressure on the real-time automated decision-making uh, infrastructure to, to separate the huge amount of, of, of chaff from the real scientific discoveries that we're interested in. Just one example of uh, the possibility of these surveys is something that I personally am really excited about. This is this, uh, this notion of a strongly lensed supernova. So Peter told you about supernova and, um, and, and why they're important for astronomy. <coughs> Now we're, getting to the, uh, now we're getting to the point where we can actually try to routinely discover things that are really, really rare. So now the supernova are the chaff. And now we're looking for the very rarest, rarest of a supernova. And we have to filter through all of the things that are, you know, just two or three years ago we would have considered ourselves lucky to find. Um, so basically, the picture of what's going on here, uh, you've got a supernova that goes off uh, far behind. Oh, this is a movie. Oh. Yeah, you've got a supernova that goes off far behind and almost perfectly aligned with the foreground galaxy. And the gravitational field of the galaxy actually distorts uh, space time and sets up multiple null geodesics that light can travel along uh, from the supernova to Earth. And so the, the upshot is that you see the same supernova in multiple different places on the sky. And they're magnified by different amounts. And the even more amazing thing is that because each image of the supernova is traveling a different geometric path to reach us, and because the geometric paths have different lengths, there are actually time delays between the multiple images of the supernova. So light emitted by the supernova at the same time will reach us at different times traveling through the different images. Um, this is just a simulation showing that. You can see one supernova in four different places because it's being lensed by this foreground galaxy here. And this is actually the galaxy that's hosting the supernova, but it's been so distorted by the gravitational field of, of the foreground galaxy that actually just looks like a ring. Um, and so, so this is the, the cool thing about this is that now, if we find these, we can actually have multiple chances to observe the same supernova. So um, the, the picture here is, you know, we've got our strongly lensed supernova, and what if we actually discovered the system when it looked like this? We know there's going to be another image coming. And it's going to be exactly the same as, as these three, just delayed in time a little bit. If we could discover this in real time and follow it up rapidly, then we could actually anticipate the arrival of this image and get the very, very earliest time data of the supernova that we could. So you're, if you remember 2011 FE, it was considered revolutionary to discover a supernova 11 hours after it blew up. Now, if we can actually know where a supernova is before it happens, then we can imagine catching the very first seconds of the supernova because we know exactly when to look for it. So this is just one uh, you know, kind of science uh, uh, project you could imagine doing with this power. Um, 
So a core collapse supernova is, is the explosion of a really massive star. So the star can't support itself uh, under its own gravity anymore. And it collapses. It forms this neutron star, which bounces and sends the shock wave careening outwards through the star. Yeah. Sorry, a naive, uh, non-expert question. Why would the gravitational relenting give you always give you four? It doesn't always give you four. Sometimes it gives you two. Sometimes How it would you be able to, to detect the pattern in that case. Detect the pattern in the I sense of... A, I see three images, yeah. and I'm sure there will be a fourth uh, that will appear. Because, uh, because we know how gravity works, so this is all governed by general relativity. So actually, what, what people do is they try to model the mass distribution of the lens, and they try to model, in the absence of lensing, the position of the source. And that actually gives you a deterministic prediction of how many images should there be and what should their time delays be. and so. That model is, you know, we have a high degree of confidence in general relativity, so uh, it, it, should, it should work pretty well. <laughs> um, and in galaxy type. <laughs> that's actually the, um, the part where there's a little bit more uncertainty, is actually modeling um, the mass distribution of the galaxy that's, that's doing the lensing, because uh, a lot of the mass is, is in dark matter. Um, so we can map out the, the distribution of luminous matter, but what the lensing is sensitive to is the total is the total mass, and so. Um, so there's confounding. That's yeah, there. there's some uncertainty on 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 what actually that mass distribution is, and that will be the main driver of the uncertainty on when we see that uh, next image of a supernova. So anyway. Um, now we, can, now we can actually talk about trying to catch the very first seconds of, of emission from a supernova. And this is, this is really kind of um, cutting edge stuff. Uh, when, it, when this shock driving the, the explosion of the star breaks out, it dredges up all this hot gas behind it, which is really UV bright. And so you get this almost delta function like uh, blue light curve that's, that's just, it lasts about half an hour. It's just the shock breaking out of the star. And um, and the, the width of it actually tells you about how big the star is that's exploding. So now if we imagine doing this multiple times, we could imagine trying to systematically understand the properties that end their lives as supernova um, by using strong lensing as a tool to, to catch the very earliest data on these explosions. So that would be really cool. The problem is that these things are super, super rare. Only two strong lens supernova have ever been found. Here they are. This is the whole field right now. Um, this beauty is called Supernova Refstall. It was discovered with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, you can see this is a real astronomical image. Uh, there's this massive galaxy right here and four images of the same supernova around it. And then the host galaxy is kind of this blue blob that's being distorted. Um, and then just last year, uh, IPTF actually found the second strongly lensed supernova. Um, this you know, this, this beautiful object is IPTF 16 GEU. You can see the four images of the supernova here, and then it's being lensed by this kind of blobby galaxy here with the host galaxy around like a ring. Um, and this was the first strongly lensed type 1A that was ever found. So we're going to be getting trillions of detections of variability with these surveys. We're bound to find a good number of these, of these strongly lensed transients. Um, but actually now we're at the level where in order to find these super, super rare objects, these really, really new cutting edge things, we have to take this real time decision making to a completely new level. Um, and that's, that's this idea of, of transient brokers. So even with machine learning, these upcoming sky surveys are going to produce so many alerts that now we can't even have humans inspect the astrophysical ones anymore. We have to actually uh, use automated brokers to determine um, which objects are scientifically interesting or unusual in addition to, to astrophysical. And so, so now we're starting to see papers come out about uh, you know, real-time decision-making frameworks to, to, to automate this process. Another way to, to look for, so I, I'm, I'm, I personally am interested in this strongly lensed supernova problem, so I've been thinking uh, a bit about this lately. A different way to do this would be, um, well, what if we could actually find all of the galaxy galaxy strong lenses? Um, and that way, anytime we saw a transient in one of them, we could just immediately follow it up. This is an image classification problem. So there's a strong lens in this image. Can anyone find it? Does anyone see it? 
on the left. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If you said it was this, you're right. Yeah. So so there's no supernova in this, but um, but you can see there's this massive elliptical galaxy here, and then there's this background galaxy that's being lensed into a ring, um, and you can see it. You know, if we could somehow train an algorithm to to go through and from all of these objects just tell us that this one is actually a strong gravitational lens, then we would be in a really good position to find these rare supernova. Um, and so there's been some really exciting work recently about using convolutional neural networks uh, for this problem. Um, one uh, example that I've, I've heard about just recently is, is this code called CMU Deep Lens. Um, and basically what they did is, is train uh, a deep residual network, basically just a kind of a, a slight variant on a typical conv convnet with 46 layers um, on simulated lenses and non-lenses uh, that LSST would look at. And basically, um, this, this, this code achieves really remarkable performance. It can classify in nine hours a sample of 100 million lens candidates. Um, and so already, in just a few hours, we're starting to approach that tens of billions of, uh, of, of objects number that LSST is expected to find over the entire 10-year duration of its survey. Um, and that's on just one card, on one single GPU. And so deep learning will let us handle the volume and data rate of these feature surveys and, and definitely feed into the real-time decision-making uh, uh, capability. And you know, just as, as another example of, of computers being the right way to do astronomy now, um, this automated lens finder is, is faster and more reliable than human volunteers that were asked to, to make the same decisions on, on the same data set. Um, last thing I want to talk about uh, scientifically is, uh, you'll remember I started this talk by discussing the discovery of Pluto. Um, and I'm sure, as you all know, Pluto is not a planet anymore. Um, but the same guy, Mike Brown, who killed Pluto, is actually now predicting that there's another planet out there going around the sun. But it's much bigger. It's about 10 times the mass of the Earth. And it's much, much farther away. It's about 1,000 times the distance from the Earth to the sun, whereas Pluto is only 40. OK, so, so basically the way that, that this planet was inferred, the presence of this planet was inferred, was uh, using mostly public data about comet orbits. So uh, looking at comets, Mike Brown and, and his colleague Constantine Batygin noticed that they're all clustered gravitationally in a very unusual way. And, and if you add a very massive planet out at a, at a great distance, you can actually explain this effect. OK, and so this is a slide from Josh. But basically, Josh's prediction is that the data that actually have photons from this planet X have already been taken. And, um, and it's, it's very likely that, uh, that you know, we can detect um, this planet using data that we already have. And, um, and it'll be you know, a group of, of astronomers and statisticians with a lot of compute resources that will actually be able to go back and retrospectively um, discover this planet and, and data that's already in the can. And so that's exactly uh, what we're working on in our group right now uh, with Michael Medford, a fellow graduate student in the astronomy department, and Peter. Um, we've developed uh, a technique to, to try to do this for the first time. And this was actually on the cover of the IEEE Spectrum magazine a couple of months ago. And basically, the idea is that just like in gravitational lensing, we understand how gravity works. And gravity is what governs the orbits of planets around the sun. And we understand how that works. We understand Keplerian orbits. So the idea is to try out every possible orbit that this planet could have and shift all of the millions of images from PTF along all of these millions and millions of possible orbits and try to add them together to uh, increase the signal to noise of, of the planet. Uh, and once we find the right one, we think we'll be able to see the planet much, much better. So here's kind of a, a video uh, explanation of this idea. So if the planet were bright, then if we took a bunch of images separated in time, we would see it kind of hoofing it across the images here as the Earth goes around. And, uh, and, and you know, we see this parallax motion. But actually, it's much more likely that this planet is faint. And so in a single image, it's much more likely that it'll look like this. It'll be much dimmer than the sky noise. So we'll just, in a, sing in a single image, we won't be able to see this thing at all. But 
if we try out the correct orbit and shift these images along that orbit, then what will happen is the signal from the planet will add coherently and we'll be able to see it come out of the noise because we've actually found the orbit that it's lying along and the images are being shifted correctly. Um, and so we're working on, on doing this search with the supercomputer at NERSC right now. Um, but of course, this technique is going to be swamped with false positives. So it comes back to this real-time decision-making idea. We're going to need to use the lessons that we learned um, with the real bogus classifier and, and auto scan to winnow the spurious detections that this technique is going to produce from the real ones. Otherwise, this would be completely untractable. We'd be back to the situation where we've got a bunch of human beings looking at all of, all of the possible planets that, that we find. So yeah, um, you know, it could be that there's this uh, giant planet way out going around the sun once every 10,000 or 15,000 years. Um, and uh, you know, with these real-time decision-making techniques, we actually have the opportunity to, to find this thing if it exists. Um, so I just want to conclude by saying um, finding changes in the night sky is now like a billion dollar plus industry. There are lots of new experiments that are being built that cost, you know, when you sum them all together, I think it's like a few billion. Um, and, you know, real time decision making pipelines and specifically machine learning have, have really been the uh, algorithmic advance that have enabled um, this problem to reach this scale. So it's an exciting time to be working on this kind of thing. And it'll be really cool to see what kind of discoveries uh, we can make aided by these uh, pipelines in the uh, near future. Thanks. Yeah. So you've told us a lot about very fascinating astronomical discoveries. And I wonder, as a theoretical computer scientist, what could my role be in helping out? So I was hoping to glean some more about the algorithmic details, but I didn't really see much. I saw a lot of fascinating astronomical pictures. I think, uh, you know, I think there, there are lots of, of, of opportunities for algorithmic innovation in how we identify these objects in this stream of detections that we're going to be getting from future surveys like LSST. Um, what is the best way to, uh, to mark an object as interesting if we've never seen it before? Um, you know, if we have uh, heterogeneous, unevenly sampled time series data, um, how, do we, how do we actually process that in a uniform way? And um, given you know, incomplete training data sets, how do, we, uh, how do we produce an algorithm that can actually um, take this streaming online data and, and say something interesting about things that it hasn't seen yet? I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing right now. Um, so if I had to say one thing, I, I would say, um, that's kind of where the action is right now, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to get involved, especially with this broker, uh, with these tr transient brokers that I mentioned just um, in one slide. Um, but I'm happy to chat more about that if, I hope that answered your question. So it seems like all of the machine learning algorithms that you described use the residual image of two images. Yeah. Is there any point in going to higher order differences, maybe looking at three or more uh, images to the same sky and looking at, kind of looking at the second derivative in discrete terms of, or, and so on, the transitions and uh, get more interesting information from that? Yeah, I think that um, that, that in principle would, uh, would be an interesting thing to look at. The problem is that you can see just on the first order uh, version how many artifacts we get. And I think if we, I think if we, you know, apply that process multiple times, we can imagine compounding the number of um, astrometric misalignments and other things that that are actually responsible for um, the situation that we're in in the first place. So I think image subtraction is a difficult problem that is numerically unstable and is prone to producing artifacts. So I think we would like to avoid it as much as we can. Um, 
But I think if, if we can improve the uh, quality of that algorithm, then in principle, things like that would be possible. And I have actually never heard of a case where people have, have done that. So it could be, it could be an interesting thing there to look at. One, one effort we did with that with the uh, IBM True North chips, um, which you can sort of program CNN on it, and what we did was we took um, uh, three different detections along with their error images as well, which helps with the problem that Danny, so it wound up being a six-dimensional problem that we're passing through, and it did fairly well on that, um, but the, the things that you have to worry about are, you know, um, are the images taken at the same time? What do you allow if they're taken slightly different times? Is there uh, some knowledge that it could be bright, say, in the blue, but not in the red? And how do you weigh that? And so all of those things have to be factored in when you train one of these things. I think another, this actually, um, kind of thinking back to your question that you just asked, I think another interesting avenue to explore here could be, how do we detect changes in the night sky without actually having to subtract images? Is there a way to, um, to, to train some kind of algorithm that can actually be sensitive to changes in brightness um, and that doesn't actually involve this image subtraction process? Um, like, could you just put in two images into some kind of a deep neural network and have it go through and identify uh, physical astrophysical changes in brightness and localize them without actually having to do this process that's so uh, prone to to producing spurious objects. That that would be an interesting thing as well. Yeah. Maybe both of your questions in the past, we've always deconvolved the notion of what discovery is to kind of inference that this is interesting. So there's the is this real or bogus is the thing that Danny's focused on. And then there's the whole other question of, to, to Peter's talk earlier, do we actually follow this up and spend telescope resources? If you now conflated those two questions where you said both at the time of discovery, is this a real thing or not? And am I interested in going after that? Um, there, then you get into really interesting questions of, uh, you know, for instance, do I need to take more data before I get confidence that this may be an interesting thing to go after? And I suspect you might be able to write down some optimization metric that allows you to answer that. Um, there's the question of, do, is this a discovery of a supernova of a sort that I want to spend telescope resources on? At what level of confidence do I have to then spend the you know, resources that are very expensive um, after that to do that follow-up. And right now we've been sort of breaking those problems up sequentially, but if the ultimate metric is to take data on, you know, something that's going to show up on the front page of the New York Times, um, if, you, if you try to figure out ways to couch the problem in uh, not sequential sense, but just sort of overall what's the final outcome, I think there'd be some really interesting things to do there, which would involve multiple images in multiple times. It would involve um, sort of bringing in sparse information from lots of disparate catalogs, because some parts of the sky have been extremely well studied before. And at the time of observation, you actually have, in principle, access to all of that other data. There are other parts of the sky that have been very poorly studied um, at other wavelengths. Uh, and bringing in the metadata from that, bringing in the time history of what you've observed on your survey and not, and asking the question about, is this worth me spending telescope resources on, rather than is this real or bogus or not, maybe the, the next thing to start contemplating. Maybe this is an aspect of that, that comment. Um, so it seems as though, in terms of telescope resources, you, you mean, High resolution spectroscopy is, is that? That's one. Yeah, I mean there there are lots of. Sounds like it's a key component. Yeah, I mean uh, spectroscopy is definitely one of the one of the fundamental and most widely sought after uh, types of follow up that we obtain. But different science cases call for different types of follow up. Um, and, and that's a limited resource relative. It's always to the limited. Yeah. Relative to the to the intensity. Um, yeah. That you can gather. Yeah. We're, we're always, yeah, we're, we're absolutely limited by follow-up resources. 
LSST is going to discover, you know, millions of supernova. We only have, uh, but the number of, of follow-up telescopes that we have, which is already saturated and oversubscribed, is not really growing. Now, is that down at the instrumental level, say again, taking taking intensity versus spectral high res higher resolution mm -hmm. spectral characterization, is that an inherent split of resources, or could you could one imagine? Uh, so you're asking being able to take high resolution per pixel spectroscopy, collapsing that. And yeah. Well, the problem. I mean, you don't always like want. It off yeah, yeah, yeah. You you don't always want to go to high resolution though, right? Because each pixel will have an inherent um, noise associated with it, and so uh, so you you can actually um, in, in some cases you you can actually beat down noise by using a lower resolution spectral instrument uh, if, if, if you don't need it. Now, I guess one of the inherent aspects is if your integration times for spectral purposes are approaching the, the, the time of evolution yeah. of the underlying process, well then you're caught. Yeah, I think um, you always want to use the lowest resolution spectroscopy you can get away with. Uh, if you go to higher and higher resolution, then you're going to end up wasting a lot of time getting the, to go after something that you could have done with a lot less exposure time on something that's. But that's something more than just a couple filters. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm puzzled by this idea of marching through a list of possible orbits to track down this planet. <clears throat> Isn't the number of orbits uncountable? Um, if, if we had an inf infinitely high resolution image, then yes. But because, uh, because the image is uh, pixelated, it, it's discrete. So the, the pixel scale actually sets the number of orbits that you can step through. But it is quite large. It's lo yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Do you assume the orbits are on the same plane as the other orbits of the planets, or do you look all over space? Uh, no, we look all at all different inclinations. Yeah, that'd be near Earth as well. Or, um, no, no, they're they're. Look, look for this purpose, but conceivably you could. These are techniques that could be used for. Actually, uh, the number of orbits you have to try increases exponentially as you. Um, move the planet closer and closer to, to Earth. Because then, because if you're, if you're very far away, then essentially 90 plus percent of the motion that you observe is due to the Earth's motion around the sun. And so it's a, it's a parallax effect. But as you move the planet closer and closer to the Earth, the contributions from the planet's proper motion end up becoming more and more important. So the size of the parameter space that you have to search over ends up increasing by like three or four parameters. And so it, it ends up being a harder problem. But in principle, if you had a big enough computer, you could do it. So, so if it's mostly parallax, then it is confined to a plane. It's the, confined to the plane of our orbit, um, the motion that you're looking for. Even if, the, even if the orbit has a high inclination, the motion that you're seeing from parallax is, is in our plane. Well, well so not, not, no. not quite. Um, there is still a proper motion component, but it's small. Yeah. It's small enough that it does matter over 10 years, which is kind of the, the time baseline that we're looking at. Um, and it's enough, to kind of, it's enough to kind of cause deviations from parallax that, that you have to scan over. But it's at the level where it's tractable and you don't have to, it's not as, it's not as computationally intensive as if we were looking for something that was like at the orbit of Mars, for example, where there are lots of different shapes that you can see on the images. But yeah, I'm, the fact that it's the fact that it's far away actually helps us for exactly that reason. So, my question is a little bit more <laughs> meta, which is, how do you in this area come up with the questions that you want to ask? Like, how do you come up with the question of, well, let's see if there's another planet that is a thousand times further from the sun? Is it like, you ought to know, you ought to look at something in the data. Yeah. And how do you start this chicken and egg? That's a really good question. And I think I would say that in most of the cases that I've seen, it's almost always driven by some kind of serendipitous discovery that leads you to formulate a theory. Like, for example, with the Planet Nine, um, 
hypothesis. Uh, the whole reason that, that people thought that it could be there in the first place is because um, uh, people were looking for, for things like Pluto out you know, maybe 40 Earth distances away from the sun. And they happened to discover that they showed this clustering that was very strange. And that led them to, to make this hypothesis that there was potentially this ten, ninth planet very, very far away from the sun, because that could explain this weird thing that they found. But, it was that, but they didn't actually set out to, to, to do that. They just happened to notice it. And it was just an observation. And then that led to this whole further line of study. And I think you know, with the supernova stuff um, that, that Peter and I have talked about, a lot of times it kind of happens along the same lines. You, you make some unexpected discovery that actually um, gets your brain thinking in a certain direction um, that you, you didn't set out to do. But now that you've found this thing, um, you know, it, it sort of clicks together. And, and, and so you know, with, with supernova, um, it was this empirical discovery that, that their uh, brightnesses happened to be correlated with the way that their light curves evolved that actually enabled this whole cosmological analysis that, that Peter um, uh, discussed in his talk. And you know, I think it's a lot of these questions are you don't. Yeah, it's 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 a difficult question. So, it's a, so like take the gravitationally lensed supernova. Mm -hmm. We know theoretically, we've known for 50 years that these events should exist, and we've sat down and we've calculated the rates. And basically, you have to find about 50,000 ordinary supernova before you see one of these where the alignment goes and you can find them. And so we knew that they existed, but we never found one. And then in PTF, we found one. And then I sat down and thought, well, gee, is there a way we could optimize things so that we'd be sensitive to finding these in the future? And then we came up with this method to do it, which is really good. And now we know we're going to find about 20 of them in the Zwicky Transient Facility and about 1,000 of them in LSST. Nobody had planned on doing that before. So it's really. Like it was to a yeah. spark, and then it's like, oh, I can optimize things to to find these and weed them out. It, that's, it's that's it's never really cool. planned out. Yeah, like yeah, like gamma ray bursts, for example, which Josh was is kind of like the world expert in gamma ray bursts. You know, the first gamma ray bursts were were found um, using a spy satellite that was uh, looking for Russian nuclear tests, um, and it was sensitive to gamma rays that you know, and and it, and actually. It, it went out in space, and they were getting all this signal that they didn't expect to find. And it turned out that it was coming from you know, distant objects far out in the distant universe. And so it was like the surprising discovery that led people to, to ask more questions. And I think it's maybe the question is, how do we, how do we find the things that we, we weren't you know, setting out to look for? That, is there a way to automate that? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. But that, that's mean, what that, you guys, that That's is, what we need you guys to tell us. That is a very okay. fundamental question, because the one thing that I can guarantee is that if you set up a survey to find something, you will find it. But you may blind yourself to a whole bunch of other interesting things. And so it's really trying to not go down that rabbit hole, I think, is where the exciting science is. So when you're looking at anomaly, like when you're, you're, you're you look at these different images, for example, mm -hmm. so you're looking for kind of anomala, anomalous anomalies. Yeah. In the, in the image. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of times we've probably missed the vast majority of interesting ones because we don't know what to look for. Are you able to at least tell, given given the residual? Which are just imaging artifacts? What, what are all the transitions are imaging artifacts versus anything else? Not supernovae, but is yeah. there a machine learning algorithm that works well to say these yeah. subtract are just imaging artifacts? Right. And the next step is the next step is to actually build an algorithm that can say something more interesting about the physical nature of the object that's producing the variations.
<coughs> and, and detecting anomalies there. Yeah. In terms of, is there a categorization of the anomalies, sort of a, a, a pipeline for generating anomalies and, and, and then working to suppress those that, those that say are instrumental? Oh. Yes. Yeah, that all happens at the level of this real bogus stuff. But I think it's, it's at the level of where we're going to be getting a million alerts per night that are not artifacts and that are not instrumental, but are actual real astrophysical things. How do we find the ones that, how do we find the ones that are, are really interesting that we've never seen before, even though we don't even really know what we're looking for? <laughs> yeah, so I had a question about these kind of like imaging artifacts. Um, like, do you believe that they kind of act like um, uh, kind of like white white noise, like kind of this independent white noise, or do you think that they're drawn from some kind of like distribution that might depend on the telescope that you just don't the but that you don't kind of that you don't know? Oh, it's absolutely the latter. Okay. Yeah, it's absolutely the latter. Um, I guess the same question is even if it if it is does depend on the telescope, do you still? Th would it be? Would you expect it to be like kind of independent between different pictures, but also between different pairs of subtractions, or could it be even dependent on time? Because because if it if it was independent, then you could presumably take like pairs of images that were both on either side of the subtraction, and if you take multiple pairs and like add together the subtractions. Yeah. Um, in 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 short, uh, nothing is independent. Okay. Um, you know. I could point to some region of the sky where there's a really bright star, and that star is going to be so bright that actually um, it, <coughs> it, it, it saturates the CCDs and causes the, the photons to bleed out to other pixels. And that will happen the same way every time we look at that part of the sky. And so for that region of the sky, we're always going to see the same artifacts in certain locations. Um, and you know, sometimes we get satellites going overhead. And so you know, they leave these trails that we actually pick up on the camera. And so you know, that, that will happen sometimes, but it's kind of random. Um, and sometimes we get, we get cosmic rays. We get high energy particles that are actually just going through space. And then they'll, they'll hit the CCD and you know, saturate it. And so that'll be, yeah. I mean, it's, there, there are not many simplifying assumptions that you can make. Yeah. So uh, you listed a couple of ways in which you know how things can go diff go wrong, and you can see something. How do you know there isn't something else systematically that's interesting that we don't know about? You're seeing pretty often. You mean with the real bogus stuff, or? Yeah, with the real bogus stuff. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's really just a question of. Um, We've had people looking at this for so long that we kind of have a sense of it at this point. I know that's not really a satisfying answer, but I mean, there could be some, there could be some horrible systematic that, that we're not aware of with the subtractions. But um, I mean, I'm trying to think of what one of those could be, and I'm, I'm having trouble. I don't know. Peter, so do you have any? There's a really good way to test how well we do and how well we don't do, which is um, oh, right, right. Yeah. supernova blow up. We'll see them. We'll find them when they're bright. We'll categorize them. But you can, of course, go back to the images where their signal to noise was lower, or for whatever reason, you miss them. They didn't pass your machine learning thresholds. And then you can go study why that was the case. And that would be an example of where <coughs> we missed something, but we can go back and understand why and model our efficiencies that way. The other thing that we're very good at doing now is we throw fakes on images. And we throw them at different brightness levels and stuff. And then we run our algorithms on that. And we study just the type of effects you're saying. Certain portion of the sky, are we better at finding things than others? Are they correlated with bright stars, bright galaxies, et cetera? And, and we can model our efficiencies all the way through. So when we do the rates, we actually do that type of work. Yes, it seems like that's going to give you pretty accurate answers for supernova detection. Right. But if there is like something <laughs> that you are classifying as an image processing artifact that's actually real, how would you know? So, uh, 
so you're talking about the other way around, where we it's a true negative, I guess is what you were saying. It's a true object, but we've negatively classified it. Yeah. Um, I guess the thing is that at least for everything that's astrophysical, we can model exactly how it will appear on the CCD. You so, know what it is. No, there's, there's only, there's, objects can either be point sources or they can be elongated due to motion, and we can, we can model those and say how well we can find them. There's just, there are not other things that we can look at. It's, it's say, very different than taking an image on the street and trying to classify what objects come into it or not, because the possibilities are almost infinite. Here, the possibilities aren't so infinite. Yeah. In general, if you took, like, if you have one of these, like, Anomalies, can you generally like say you grab like 10 of them? Would you be able to say why they're anomalies? Yeah, so um, We did spend a lot of time in the very beginning Going down and saying oh this was due to a cosmic ray. This was due to a satellite or an airplane or a bright star or so. and and we went through and we did that and we found that added no value um, labeling putting those labels in there and trying to train on it, we just found that added no value. Yeah, I didn't mean in terms of training, I meant more in terms of that would therefore give you, be able to, if you know why it's an anomaly, that would presumably give you more confidence that you're not falsely rejecting something that does exist, that you don't, that like, but, but you just, but it doesn't look like something you'd seen before, as in like, yeah. that's to Eric's question. I guess, we're, I guess we're just really blind to the fact that objects either move or they stay still, and we know how they'll behave on the CCD. If they did something crazier, then yeah, we would like, you know, we're not going to find UFOs that do like a circle <laughs> in the sky. So we're not good at that. We, we find things that'll do straight lines. We'll find things that are stationary. So, but other than that, there's not much we can do. Yeah, one thing to, to keep in mind is that the atmosphere blurs out um, the shape of, of objects in a very kind of well-known way. Um, and because the things we're looking at are so far away, they are all so tiny that, that basically they just look like they have this, it's called a point spread function. They all just look like this dot, basically. Every, everything that's not a galaxy just looks like a dot. And so that makes it easier. <laughs> <laughs> Just as, as a check, so no systematic bias because of northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere issues, orientation with the ecliptic, uh, galactic plane. That's at the, for supernovas. That's all kind of just. Yeah, I mean it's hard to find supernova in the galaxy, or like when you're looking through the galaxy, because there's so many stars in the field that it's hard to do that image subtraction um, because you have like this really densely crowded CCD and it just, the algorithm breaks that's not, down. That's not blocking out any interesting galactic cluster structure or anything like that. That's kind of uniform. Yeah. Just to check that. Yeah. Thank you, Danny. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>